So I want to officially welcome everyone to session four of the UVM Extension New Farmer Projects Groundwork Program, a decision-making guide for purchasing a new or used tractor. And our presenter today is Shane LeBreak. So today's webinar follows an initial program focused with our focus with our earlier sessions on how mechanization decisions fit into overall farm business planning, as well as how to approach mechanization with an eye to efficiency. Um, Shane's session will turn us to a tractor-specific focus, uh, tractor being the most expensive and central mechanical purchase for many new farmers. If my math is right, Shane has been teaching machinery and maintenance classes to new farmers and others for over 20 years. Uh, he's taught in Massachusetts, in Maine, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and Vermont, maybe some others. I may be missing some. Uh, for many different organizations and groups. And I will uh, pass it over to you now. Thanks, Shane. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, pleased to be here. And this is my first time doing a webinar. So hopefully uh, there's no technical glitches as we go through. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so I've been doing this for quite a while. And uh, hopefully we get a lot of good ideas out. And I wanted to say, too, that at the very end of the workshop, if anybody wants to stay on for a little bit and uh, ask me specific questions, we can do that after the, the 12 o'clock. Uh, bell ring. So just to, to let you all know that. So I'm going to start going through the slides. There's a, a good number of slides to go through. And uh, hopefully I'll keep the pace uh, quick enough so that we can get through them all and cover all the materials. So here goes. Um, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. <laughs> Uh, issues to consider when buying a tractor. So I think it's really important to know what you want to do. Uh, I like to adhere to the advice of William McDonough, a designer, who says design is the first signal of human intention. So we need to know what we want to do and then create a design to fulfill it. And in that way, it's important to know also what is our scale, how much power do we really need, and of course, how much can we afford to spend. And I think that there's a difference between how much we uh, are willing to spend and how much we can really spend. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we also need to know, are there specific horsepower requirements for your existing implements? Uh, of course, if it's a new farm or a beginning farmer, they may not have the implements yet. That's important to consider when we, again, think about scale and acreage. What is the buyer's skill level operating tractors? And what is their skill level maintaining tractors? Those are two things to think about, especially when thinking about buying used equipment. And will there be multiple users? If there are farms where they expect to have hired people or other family members operating the machinery, I think that has some bearing in terms of making a decision about which tractor to purchase. Other issues, how much money is available, as I suggested earlier, and then how much more is the buyer willing to pay? And those are two distinct things. Sometimes you have a certain amount of money in a budget or set aside or cash on hand, however you want to think about that. But then how much more would you be willing to pay if you could finance or if you had other sources of funding? And that can make a big difference in what you end up purchasing and in, and in a very positive way. Um, sometimes some debt can be uh, very constructive in terms of actually running a business. And as small time or small farmers, or even mid-sized farmers, we are self-employed business owners. And I've encountered a lot of people very resistant to debt in this sector of the economy. And I'm not sure that's always to their own benefit. Some debt may not be a bad thing if it's manageable. And then how much time does a buyer have to look for a tractor? And that becomes a critical issue um, for some people. Uh, if they're making a decision based on uh, rushing through because they need to get this right away, they may not actually get what's, what's best for their, their operation or for their wallet. Uh, barring unlimited funds, of course, um, there's always compromise. And some people make really bad decisions. Not that this wouldn't be a bad tractor if you wanted to restore it. But uh, I'm not sure that would be appropriate for many small-scale operators or mid-scale operators anymore. No offense to the John Deere fans out there. So from my, uh, from my perspective, I want to get the most bang for the buck. I want all of the things listed there, versatility, performance, cost. I think you know versatility is key. Um, as many functions as possible for the best value is what I'm really looking 
to gain from buying a tractor. And by the way, I have bought both new and used tractors, both for myself and for the organizations I've worked for. I've uh, bought, let's see, at least three new tractors and at least five or six used tractors over the years. So I've, I've gone through the process of this for myself as well as for advising others. So what do tractors do? Many people oftentimes don't even think about this. Um, they pull. Obviously, that was their first purpose. They were replacing draft animals, so they provide traction. Uh, they lift, and that's become an increasing feature of tractors, not only from the three-point hitch on the back, but with front end loaders. And then power, providing power transfer from the PTO. And those are all critical issues when we think about what do we really need from a tractor? How much are they going to provide for us in each one of those areas? And then why do we want to own a tractor in the first place? Well, for major work applications, most of us who are thinking of farming or landscaping, uh, maybe logging, it's really work. Uh, for some people, it's just a hobby, the restoration people. And then for some, it's prestige. And of course, let's be honest about that. Some people really like having shiny new tractors. Uh, so get the most return um, by asking ourselves, what's appropriate to the scope of work? Are we making hay? Are we doing vegetables? Uh, is it crop production? Do we need a cultivating tractor? Do we need something to pull a large round scale baler? What type of work are we intending to do? Is it going to be multi-purpose? Is it going to do everything on the farm? Um, it needs to be appropriate to the scale of the operation, the acreage uh, that's actually going to be worked with the machine. It should be appropriate to the experience and the skill level of the, of the buyer. And I think that's a critical point, because I've seen a lot of people buy tractors that they really had no experience or skill um, to operate when they, when they made the purchase. And it should be appropriate to the available purchasing funds. And again, that could be both what's the cash on hand and what's available for funding either through uh, financing or other sources. Versatility is key. When we look at choosing a tractor, there's a lot of criteria we should examine. Um, of course, the, uh, the horsepower needed to do the work that we expect it to do. And I want to make distinctions here. So you have, uh, when you look at uh, manuals for buying tractors or the, the literature that comes from the dealer, or you could go to a site if you're buying a used tractor, for example, tractordata.com will list all of the original specs for the tractor, including the gross engine horsepower. Uh, which in this particular example for this New Holland was 45 horsepower. And then they'll list the PTO horsepower, which is usually a, f a few horsepower less than the engine horsepower. And if you look at a hydrostatic transmission, uh, which some applications are really better served by hydrostatic, you're going to see an even greater drop. So uh, that's something to think about, is, is how much horsepower you need and, and what type of engine and transmission are you going to use, or rather, what type of transmission for the tractor. So we could also choose between a two-wheel drive tractor or a four-wheel drive tractor. And four-wheel drives are also called mechanical front-wheel drive. You'll see that designation. You'll see front-wheel assist uh, in some uh, literature. And it's good to point out that you can get up to 40% more pulling power when the four-wheel drive is engaged. And a couple of slides here, the one on the right of the old Ford Workmaster. Uh, I've done some research on this tractor recently for a client I'm working for. And I found this picture, and I was really surprised. I didn't realize that tractor was even available in four-wheel drive. And I thought at first, when I looked at the picture, somebody had just put um, treaded tires on the front, which is usually assigning a four-wheel drive um, you, can, you can tell it's four-wheel drive by looking at that. But then I looked underneath at the, both the axle I can draw the arrow over to this. Let's see if I can do this right. Uh, where's my pencil? Why is it not going to double click it? Sure, Kristen, if you can double can you click it. Here? Yeah. Oh, I have to double click it. There we go. So right there, if you look on this tractor, you can see it's got a differential under the front as well as the, uh, the uh, final drives on the axle that in suggests that indeed this is a four-wheel drive tractor, which was kind of unusual for this size tractor back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s when it was So Shane, uh, first can I interrupt you for a second? How did are we you, doing? Um, yeah, did you draw that? Did you draw on that slide? I just took the uh, 
Let's see if I can do that again. I took the pencil over to just point out a couple things. Yeah, you have to draw it, I drag did. and draw, and then uh, l release it, and it'll show up for us, I believe. Oh, like that. Is that showing up? No. <laughs> it's showing up on my slide. Yeah. It's not showing up on, on the other slides? No, and we're getting, uh, there's one. I see it. There we go. Now we see it. Yellow. Oh, I have to. Re I have to release it. Okay. Yep. Maybe that. There works. you go. Yep. And folks are letting so, us know they see it too. All right. Great. There's the differential, and I'll draw over to here around there. That's the front axle. Uh, the final drives on the front axle, indicating that that's a four-wheel drive tractor. Sorry, I'm still learning this technology. You're doing great, and we saw that second line is great. Great. All right. But it just said sweet Ford. Howard likes that Ford. Yeah, that was a nice tractor, uh, indeed. So let's see. Why did okay? Here we go. So we also want to consider what kind of a transmission we want, either gear shift or hydrostatic. That will also affect the price. Uh, hydrostatic transmissions are generally more expensive. Uh, whether it has a ROPS, a rollover protective structure, or a cab, I think that's an absolute must. Um, which automatically wipes out from the criteria list a lot of the older tractors that are too old to even be retrofitted with an appropriate ROPS. Uh, a cab, of course, makes the, the entire operation a lot safer. Uh, what type of three-point hitch do we need? A category one, two, or three, which relates to the lift capacity of the three-point hitch at the rear of the tractor. The uh, higher the category number, the greater the lift capacity. Most of us working in even the, the dairy applications I've seen, the haymaking applications, are in the category two range or category one range. Category three would be really big scale stuff like we see more out in the Midwest, not typically here in the Northeast. And then to some degree, the quality or reputation of the maker. Um, you know, there are a bunch of, of tractors coming in the market now from other countries. Some of those aren't really well known here, like Mahindra. Uh, there's some from China. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, they're, they're, the value might be good for the money in terms of uh, getting a new tractor for less than $15,000, but I think you have to be forewarned, you get what you pay for. Oh, somebody just saw the Zetor. I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I'm starting to try and follow your notes as well, folks, so bear with me if I'm not catching all that quickly enough. And that's a good point from M. Manning about, having a dealer who can offer service in the area, and I'll try and comment on that a little bit later. Okay, next slide. We also have to look at uh, other things on the tractor, the tire type. Uh, there are three standard tractor tire types, the R1 ag tires, which are the typical treaded in the rear, maybe ribbed in the front or treaded in the front if it's all-wheel drive, four-wheel drive. You can have the R3 turf tires, which are primarily used for mowing applications on golf courses, uh, athletic fields, that type of thing, or R4 industrial, which are more of a flatter uh, profile tire, wider and, and flatter. Uh, for most people doing ag work, the most appropriate one would be the R1 um, ag tires, and I've got a slide coming up that illustrates all of this. Whether or not you want a front-end loader on the tractor, uh, I highly recommend getting one if you're only going to have one tractor on the farm, get it with a front-end loader, uh, ideally with a quick attach that allows it to come on and off real quickly, and a quick coupler which allows you to switch from the bucket to other front-end attachments like a pallet fork or grapple hooks, which would actually a, a grapple hook would require a third set of hydraulic ports, uh, auxiliary hydraulics. Whether or not to get front end weights or tire weights, or whether the tractor comes with that, if, whatever you're looking at. Uh, hydraulic ports at the rear for implements requiring hydraulic lifting capacity. And then telescoping links on the lower links of a three-point hitch. Uh, somebody asked, is that the same thing as a quick connect? I don't think that is, uh, Rory. I think a quick connect is, is something that actually makes it easier to back up to implements and attach without getting off the tractor. There's a number of those on the market now. Um, I, I'm going to show you some slides right now of all of these options I just mentioned, actually, so you'll see in a minute. So here are the different tire types. Let's see if I can do this again. Uh, double click. Uh, let's see here. Let try this. Okay, here we go. Come on. 
I'm sorry. If you look at the slide on the um, to the left of the screen, oh, actually, I think I do show the pencil. Why is it not drawing? Did you release it? Yeah, I did. Um, double click. I'm drawing it over. Why is it not doing anything? Hmm. I have the pencil showing on my screen, but it's not drawing lines. Oh, there we go. Can people see that? I'm getting a black line. Is nope, going can't around see the it yet. And then release it, and then it'll, there we now go. Yep, you? now we can see it. <laughs> okay. So those are those are turf tires on on both the front and back, which suggests this is a four wheel drive tractor when they have matching tires front and back. Um, if we go over to this Kubota, and I'll draw around those tires. Those are R4 industrial tires. Notice the flatter profile. And down in the bottom uh, slide, we can see, or bottom picture in the slide, we can see the three lined up next to each other: the R3 turf tires, the R1 ag tires, which are in the center, and then the R4 industrial. And if you notice, those are all on the same size rim. So the profile of the tire in terms of height and width is different for the three of those. I was trying to buy a used tractor four years ago here where I live outside of Washington, D.C., and I really wanted ag tires for my tractor. And all I could find here on everything that was listed on Craigslist and in the region were R4 industrial tires, which was interesting, I think, because of the market uh, makeup in this area. So loader features. Uh, the slide on the left shows a quick attach loader that is off the tractor. That is not a very difficult thing to do once you get used to doing it. I take my loader off frequently when I'm doing jobs such as uh, custom mowing for people and I have to work in really tight areas along fences. I take my loader off when I do any tillage work because I don't want that extra weight up front causing compaction. And then uh, over here on the right, there's a slide showing a removable digger bar, which um, I take that on and off my bucket all the time, depending on the type of work I'm going to do. So that's a nice feature on the tractor. Um, I'm not following all the chats going on over there. If I miss something, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll let you know, too. Um, I'm happy to help keep an eye on that, Shane. And sure, I would appreciate you that. Up. Thank you. I hope I'm yep. not rushing too quickly through all of these slides for people, either. Yeah, let, so let's say no, if you want them to slow down, it's completely fine. We'll, we'll try to slow it down if anybody uh, has that request. But so far, it seems like we're OK. Very good. So this next slide shows a series of different types of weights uh, that are available for tractors to help with uh, ballast. And let's see if I can get my pencil to work again. Uh, I don't know why this, I have such a, hmm. Or there's a pointer arrow. Is that right, Kristen? There is a pointer arrow. It's the second one down, the one that probably um, shows as a starburst. Oh, yeah. And I you single them to drag, though. I, I double click, I get them all, and then I try and drag it. It won't drag. Yeah. OK, well, OK, wait, now I have it. Great. Can people see the arrow pointing yep. to the front end weights on the John Deere's? Yep, okay, we've got so it. Are, that's a series of front end weights. Some people call those suitcase weights that can be added to a bar on the front of the tractor. Now, if you intend to use those, the tractor actually has to have a weight bracket on the front of the tractor, and not all tractors do. So if that's a, a concern when you're buying a tractor, needing that weight up front, you need to make sure that there's actually a way to attach the weight. If I take, if we go over to this, uh, the wheel weight, looking at this Kubota, there's a rear wheel weight there. Now, the other option for the rear wheels is to have ballast, a liquid ballast, uh, inside the tire itself. Um, and there are potential issues with that that we'll get into in a few moments. But another common uh, solution is to put a wheel weight on the rim of the uh, rear tires. Or then you can also have uh, front wheel weights, which is less common today, but on a lot of the older tractors, uh, you would see weights on the front wheels as well. So we have a question, Shane, in that uh, Brett yes. is wondering what operations might require weights. 
I think uh, there's, there's a couple actually. If you're doing anything with a front end loader and you've got nothing on the back of the tractor, meaning an implement that would count, act as a counterbalance to uh, the load in the loader up front, like if you're moving logs or if you're moving um, heavy manure or compost, it would be really good to have something on the back to, counter, to act as a counterweight so you could have an implement attached, but sometimes that's not practical. In that case, you'd actually want weight in the rear wheels, whether it's ballast in the tires, uh, liquid ballast, or a weight, as you see mounted in the, um, the slide here, uh, to, to act as a counterbalance to the load up front. Otherwise, you risk uh, having the tractor lift up from the rear uh, if you were using the front end loader. And I've seen that happen. Uh, in other cases, you want extra weight up front, either from a front end wheel weight or from the, wheel, uh, the, the suitcase weight to provide stability for the tractor. Uh, there are implements that um, can actually raise the tractor up off the front wheels when they engage the ground or depending on the terrain or, or obstacles you might encounter. And that's certainly not a really good feeling is to feel your front wheels coming up, up off the ground, especially if it's happening fast. I and came she, across a, Yes, go ahead. So, so Martha uh, Manning just made a comment that moving round bales with a front end loader is an operation where additional weight is needed as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So if that's something you're going to do in your operation, and that goes for both uh, vegetable growers and livestock producers because we moved round bales on the vegetable farm I managed um, for mulching. And um, we made sure we always had a counterweight on the back of the tractor. Exactly, that's a really good point. And some people are now getting bale spears for both their front end loader and for their three-point hitch so they can move two bales at a time, um, which the back bale would act as your counterweight in that case. All right, moving on. Uh, the slide, is my arrow still there? Can you see the arrow? It's Not yet on, on this screen. Uh, the blue arrow? Nope, uh, don't see it right now. Now? Yep. Got it. Okay. I'm We've got another question. Out. Can I can I read it to you, sure, Shane? Sure, please. Yes, So it says the three-point hitch sprayers that don't ride on wheels, so it's not a question, it's a comment. So three-point hitch sprayers that don't ride on wheels make the front tippy as well. It's Terrence Bradshaw. Yes, well, that would make sense because if it's attached to the three-point hitch and there's no uh, gauge wheels or anything like that, um, and they're loaded, you know, with, with the liquid of the spray, you know, most water-based liquids are going to be eight pounds to a gallon. If you've got 100 gallon sprayer that's 800 pounds plus the weight of the rig so that's a you know well over a thousand pounds on the back of the tractor you would definitely want something up front as a counterweight and uh, so in this new slide on on the showing the quick coupler loader there's two things I'll point out there so the arrow currently is pointed at the uh, the levers that allow you to lift up and then the you, using your front end loader um, joystick, you can back out and leave the bucket on the ground and then go attached to some other thing like pallet forks or a bale spear. So those are real handy to have and make the front end loader much more versatile. And then right behind, let me see if I can do this with my arrow, where it's pointing right now under the dead center of the tractor, that is the front end weight rack for that tractor. And I can mount four suitcase weights right there. When I have my loader off and I'm mowing or rototilling, anything that puts weight on the back, I'll put suitcase weights up front. Um, side frame weights, Donald Burgess, interesting point. Um, I've seen those, but that's quite rare. Um, but again, you're looking at older tractors in that case. And then if we go over to this slide, this is probably one of the things I've most come to appreciate on my own tractor. It was recommended to me a few years ago up in Maine when I was teaching there, uh, getting a hydraulic top link. If you do any groundwork, grading, uh, even cultivating aggressively, this hydraulic top link allows you using hydraulics from the levers uh, uh, on, the, on the tractor from the operator's deck, you can um, adjust your pitch of your, of your implement uh, forward and back uh, to cut in more aggressively or, or to lean back. And it's a wonderful uh, add-on to a tractor. But it does require that you have uh, at least one set of rear hydraulic ports on the tractor. So if you're looking at tractors and you want to have features that use hydraulics, that's another thing. And I think one of my future slides actually 
uh, demonstrate that. Yeah, hydraulic ports. So to the um, left side of the screen, we have one set of hydraulic ports on this one tractor. And then if we go over to the right side, this is two sets of hydraulic ports. And on many tractors, you can get anywhere from one to three sets of hydraulic ports. Going back to the lower links, the question that was raised earlier, um, the slide here on the right, can you see the arrow? Is that showing? Yes, it is. Very good. So that slide shows a telescoping lower link. And if I press down on this lever here, it allows me to then extend the actual lower link. And that is very useful when you're backing up to attach to an implement. And maybe one side is not quite uh, squared up properly, and you, you need a little extra um, uh, length on your lower link to actually reach the pin. Those lower links, uh, the telescoping lower links are great. You do have to remember when using those, before setting the power takeoff or the top link, you have to get up on the tractor, put it in reverse, and back up and lock them into place before attaching the other two attachment points, the power takeoff and the top link. If we look over here in the slide on the left, uh, these lower links do not have telescoping link potential. So that's just to point that out. I really like having the telescoping links. Uh, on these two John Deere's, this one here, which is from probably the late 50s, that has the standard, or what I call the common lower links. You, they can't be extended out. Um, so you, you don't have a lot of options when you're backing up. And then I'll go over to this big new John Deere that my neighbor just bought a couple months ago. It's hard to see here, but these lower links, which by the way, some people do call them rock shafts. That was old John Deere terminology. They have uh, telescoping links as well. And the mechanism is a little different on these. There's actually a little pin. And I don't have a good picture of this. But there's a pin that you pull up, and that allows you to extend the links. Uh, and you can see this tractor so here has two sets of hydraulic ports as well. Yes, yeah, we had a question um, from Rory. How hard expensive is it to switch out the common lower links for telescoping ones? Um, I think you could do that. Uh, you would need to go to the dealer that the tractor, like if it's a Kubota tractor, go to a Kubota dealer to order those. What you would do, I'm going to go back a slide uh, for Rory. Um, what you would do is you would, if you look at the slide where I just put the arrow on the left, you would have to disconnect these lower links from three points. One is there, one is up here, and then again uh, from the sway brackets. And then you would put on the new telescoping link and then put all the things back together. Um, I see there's a couple of comments here. Let me see. Uh, Terry said that they can be hard to operate once they are weighted down with an implement. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Terry. From my use of them, you, when you're attaching the implement, you hitch from point, let me see if I can do this here on this picture uh, on, the, on the left. You would attach it, the lower left link first. Then you go over to the lower, lower right link. And so what you would do is attach those two lower links first. And that's where you would use the telescoping links is to get closer to the pin, as I just noted over on the other slide, so that you can actually mount the lower links to the implement. Once you've done that, if they are extended open because you opened them up, you would then have to get on the tractor and back up and lock them before attaching the top link or the power takeoff shaft. So I'm not sure how you mean they would be hard to operate once they are weighted down. If you could clarify that or ask me after the session or in the Q&A, we could try and um, address that more clearly. And I see that, um, I don't know Manning's first name, there must have, if you, are, if you will be hitching three-point hitch implements by yourself, I agree completely that um, they make life a whole lot easier. And I think for people who are really frustrated by attaching with three-point hitches, these are one of the features that makes it incredibly simpler 
to attach. So I highly recommend them when you're looking at buying whether either a used or a new tractor. I will point out though, I was just at a farm last weekend doing a workshop and I noticed that the these um, the the adjusters for the lower the telescoping links were both badly damaged so that you couldn't even move them. And that have ha had happened because apparently they would let these uh, sway freely and they would hit the tires and they had been completely damaged or from pulling something on the drawbar was the other case. So um, when you're looking at tractors and assessing, that would be something to look at is the condition of those telescoping links. I'm going to move on here because we still have a lot to cover. So you're choosing a tractor and looking at your criteria. Another one is whether to get one with a gasoline engine or a diesel engine. And um, having worked on both, I've become a big fan of diesel engines over the years. Uh, almost all new tractors today are made with diesel engines. There's still a few small ones on the market that are made with gasoline engines. But with gasoline engines, um, you're going to have a lot more maintenance issues. You've got carburetors, distributors, the spark plug wires, the spark plugs. Uh, the coil, there's just a whole lot more going on there in the ignition system, which requires more mechanical ability uh, and more maintenance, frankly. Um, they're also less powerful for uh, the same amount of horsepower, you're going to get more torque or twisting force out of a diesel engine. Um, and diesel engines tend to be a lot more durable over time. So if I were looking at a 25-year-old, well, let's say about a 35-year-old tractor, something from the late 70s, mid-70s, and I had an option between a gasoline or a diesel engine, I would probably lean strongly towards the diesel engine. Of course, the older tractors from the, the 40s, 50s, 60s that had gasoline engines, some of those companies are now obsolete or they've been merged into others. Um, and some of those parts, quite frankly, are getting hard to find. Uh, for those older gasoline engines. Also, there's an issue with ethanol in our gas today that's creating problems with engine parts, and that's another consideration um, if you're dealing with gasoline engine tractors. Uh, so diesels, you know, they're more durable. Um, they do, because it's pure compression that's, a, that's causing the combustion of the fuel-air mixture, you need a really strong battery in the winter to get them to start, or you can install a heating plug in the engine block, which would make that easier to start. So some, some of you who are up in the north, in Vermont, northern New York, northern New Hampshire, Maine, you'll see a lot of those tractors that have the plugs coming out of the engine. So that signifies that they have a heating element in the block, which will help them start more readily in the winter. They're generally easier to maintain as well as uh, a little less costly to maintain. So um, I'm, I've become a big fan of diesel engines over the years. And here are two slides. Uh, slide number, uh, the slide on the um, left shows the components of a gasoline engine. You'll see that there's a distributor there, and you've got sp spark plug wires coming out of the distributor, as well as spark plugs over there. If you aren't sure what you're looking at, those are the signs that you've got a gasoline engine. Spark plugs and spark plug wires, that's what you want to be looking for. Whereas over here on the diesel engine, We've got a uh, fuel injector pump, and we've got the fuel lines coming out going into the cylinders. Uh, that's, that's actually not a good photo of that, um, the fuel injection pump. That's actually probably the hydraulic pump in that picture. Sorry, I didn't get that clear. On to the next slide. Other things to think about, how easy is the tractor to use, especially if you're uh, an inexperienced operator, are the levers, the controls, the pedals. Uh, pedal location is also important. I've, I've worked with uh, particularly women farmers who are much shorter than some of their male counterparts, and they have trouble reaching the pedals with their legs, even with the seat all the way up in the most front position. Uh, getting on and off the tractor. Some of the older tractors, the transmission ran right under the very center, and you had to step up and over that. Um, not only is that a bit of a safety issue, getting caught up on that and tripping, off the tractor, um, it's just plain sometimes not very easy to get on and off uh, of the tractor. And then noise levels, um, how noisy is it from the operator's deck? So the question then really is how user friendly is the tractor? And I think a lot of the newer ones, a lot of thought has been given to that and they're a lot more user friendly. Uh, who's going to service or maintain the tractor? Will it be the buyer or will it be a dealer or some mechanic who you know? 
what is the estimated cost of that routine maintenance? So you have fluids, you have all your filters, um, less frequently belts and hoses. Most tractors just have a single belt, but uh, there's that. Your radiator hoses, um, maybe hydraulic hoses, occasionally tires. All of those things have to be factored into, over time, the estimated cost of maintenance. Some things are going to be annual, primarily fluids and filters, and then other things uh, over a couple or three, four years, depending on the hours of use. Uh, what is the location of the nearest dealer who you can get parts and service from? Somebody raised that earlier. And I, I, a little editorial comment there, um, I really want to have tractor dealers surviving in our region. And our demand for their services helps keep them alive. And as they disappear, so does our ease of operating our machinery when we need to do repairs and get parts. Even though the internet can be of some use in that, the internet's not going to actually get you um, maintenance done. It's just going to help you get the parts. The cost of the implements. When you get a larger tractor, a category two tractor, um, you're going to be paying more for the implements as well. They're going to be more steel, and the power takeoff shafts are going to be larger. So um, everything when you go up in size is going to cost more. And then also how easy it is to get implements on and off the tractor. Um, when you get up into category two, from personal experience, I know that just managing the attaching of power takeoff shafts is a lot harder on larger tractors. And there's a little story there. Um, let me go to the next slide first, and I'll share this with you. Well, there's a new tractor for you. That was mine that I bought four years ago, uh, almost to the day. It was right around April, right around today, frankly, uh, four years ago, now that I think about it. And here's a used tractor. And I'll just point out uh, with the arrow, you've got turf tires on this tractor, um, front end loader. But this is not one that's easily uh, detached. You do have a canopy up on top. Um, this is from the mid-'80s, this tractor. Interesting to point out how the bucket has some big dents on the top uh, rim of the bucket, sign of some uh, possible abuse with this tractor. Um, so things to look for. Going back to this story, I just uh, had a phone call about two months ago from a woman who was rather frantic about a tractor purchasing decision she was making. She was going to buy a used case tractor that was about a 68 horsepower tractor from the 1980s. And it had uh, two-wheel drive. It was not four-wheel drive. There was no front-end loader. And um, it had a cab. And she was basically calling me for affirmation that this was going to be a good decision. And I had a lot of reservations about it. This was for a very small vegetable farm. I thought that was way more power than she needed. I don't feel like she really needed to have a cab, even though cabs can be a very safe feature. Um, and I thought since it was a Category 2 implement tractor, that that was really going to create some challenges in the use. Uh, every implement she would have to buy for that tractor would be a lot harder to get on and off the tractor. Um, I just met with this person over the weekend, and, and I think there's a little bit of buyer's remorse there, and, and she has the tractor now. So um, you know, those are real issues to think about. Uh, how, how big do you really want to go, and what's that going to mean in terms of buying things and attaching them? And do you see the question that just came in? It's uh, Ma Maggie um, and Thomas uh, are asking, do older tractors lose their horsepower over time? That's a good question, and I was just advising on that to another client just the other day. Um, so the question, do older tractors lose horsepower? Really what's happening, if you understand how engines work, that over time, um, things are going to wear out in the engine, the rings, uh, maybe the bearings. And all of those internal parts of the engine are, are precisely machined, and the engineering is very precise. And as they wear out, you're actually creating space for fluids to travel up and down, combustion particles to travel up and down inside the cylinders where they're not supposed to. And you start to lose compression. And so literally, when you start losing compression, you're losing power. And so yes, on older tractors, oftentimes the rated horsepower, which might be, let's just say, on that um, Ford Workmaster 641 we saw earlier, um, the real pretty one that was four-wheel drive that I mentioned. Yeah, that tractor was rated at 48 horsepower in 1959 when it was made. But realistically today, you might only be able to get maybe 42. 
maybe less. And that's all going to be a function of how well it was maintained over the years. There's also on that particular tractor, I just did a lot of research on that model. So the engine was rated at 48 horsepower, but the PTO was only rated at 32. And a person wanted to run a rototiller off this tractor that required 30 to 40 horsepower uh, from the power takeoff. And they were wondering if that tractor was going to give enough power to run the rototiller. And frankly, you know, I had to say you're right on the edge because if you've lost compression on that tractor, and it's, well, that was made in 1959, her model, so it's 53 years old, quite likely it has, you may not be getting 30 horsepower at the power takeoff, which means, you know, you're really underpowered for that rototiller, especially if you have heavy clay soils, the soil's wet or rocky, um, your rototiller is going to not be doing what it was designed to do, which is till the soil well. So yes, the answer to that question is that oftentimes they will lose power over the years, especially if they have not been well maintained, which is a real issue when you're looking at older tractors. Do you have time for another question now, Shane, or do you want to keep going with where your direction? I, uh, we'll keep going. And again, we, can, we, we are going to have Q&A, uh, hopefully, if I get through these next few slides. So looking at newer used, uh, there's a list of pros and cons here. Um, this slide's been up for a few minutes. Hopefully you've had a chance to read through that. And they can come back to this. Is that correct, Kristen? Uh, yes. And and every, yes. The, uh, Everybody the has the PDF, and this will be posted on the uh, Groundwork website. OK, one thing I just want to point out, you know, really the only advantage I can see on a used tractor is price. Um, and I, I don't mean to be dismissive of buying used tractors, but um, you know, it may not have the desired features you want. I was looking to get a used tractor four years ago, and I had a really hard time finding one that had four-wheel drive, ag tires, front-end loader, gear shift transmission, all things that I wanted. Um, beyond that, a real critical point is the history that we don't know. And on an older tractor from the 50s or 60s that may have been through three or four owners, we have no way of knowing what kind of maintenance that tractor received. So going back to the point about lower horsepower with older tractors, if they were poorly maintained over the course of that time, it's very likely you've lost some power. And we don't know that. We just can't really ascertain that history on much older tractors. So I'll let you read through that slide, and you can probably uh, uh, do that on your own time later, the pros and cons. Um, I, I should point out, too, uh, the dealer financing available on new tractors today, if you qualify 0% down, 0% financing for, or 0 down, 0% financing for five years, you know, we're running small businesses. That's basically money being loaned to you for free, and that's not something to, uh, to disregard quickly. So if you're buying new, talk to others uh, for makes it interest you. Do some comparison. You can go online. I mentioned earlier to somebody, you can actually build your tractor on some websites. You can go and click on all the features that you want, and it will tell you what you're going to expect to pay. But the critical point, again, know what you need before buying, not just what you want. And if you're buying used, I really recommend spreading the word. Um, there's some really good w websites out there, tractorhouse.com. If you're using Craigslist, you might want to try using Search Tempest if you don't know about that. That extends the uh, distance of search using Craigslist. It's a wonderful feature if you're looking for tractors. Of course, there's a lot of farming newspapers. You've got classifieds now online. Um, there's a lot of places where you can, can look for used tractors. So now, the real critical part, and I'm going to, boy, we got, we're, we're getting short on time. Uh, maybe this is the most important part. If we're looking at used tractors, what are the criteria? Real quickly, there will be a slide to follow this, a bunch of slides to illustrate these points. Is it clean? Is the sheet metal solid? Is it rusted or dented or damaged? The condition of the seat can tell you a lot. Just how well was it cared for? If it has a cab, is it in sound condition? The, the windows are all uh, sound. There's no broken glass. The windows and doors open. Um, does it have a canopy? And if it does, is that or the ROPS damaged? Um, that's a sign that somebody may have been operating the tractor recklessly. Can you still see the manufacturer tag and the ID or the serial number? That's useful information if you have to buy parts or you're trying to date the tractor. Are there signs of leaking fluids? And are the lower links damaged on the three-point hitch? 
So going to look at some of these things, in the first slide here, uh, you can see this, this shows a dented grill. Uh, it's dented up on top. There's some real signs of abuse on this tractor. Uh, it's been run rough. Over at this John Deere, if we go up and look, there's a damaged canopy. Somebody was brush hogging close to the edge of the field near the woods, ran up against a tree. Um, I would be really weary of, uh, weary of both of these tractors, just wondering how they were operated. Looking at this one down here, we see evidence of leaking fluids. Uh, it's hard to see from the slide, but there could be a leaking head gasket. That would be something I'd be really concerned about. And then going over to this slide, just looking at this, this is a tractor with, you know, somebody didn't take the time to blow this off occasionally, keep that stuff clean off the back of the tractor where your hydraulic ports are and your hydraulic fill port, which are very sensitive to dirt and dust and debris. You don't want that stuff getting into your hydraulic system. So if we're going to check a, a tractor over, check all the fluids. Do a walk around. Familiarize yourself. Where are the dipsticks? You want to check the level and condition of the engine oil. Uh, pull the dipstick. If you see something that looks like mayonnaise or milk, that's a sign that you've got water in the oil. Definitely something to stay away from. Look at the coolant. Is it rusty? That's something else to stay away from. It means it hasn't been changed in a long time. Is it at the proper level? Uh, check the high trans fluid. Is that level up to proper uh, specs? Or on older tractors, you're probably dealing with gear oil, and they may have check uh, plugs or fill level plugs, which are harder to check because uh, you have to remove the plug to see if it's actually full. Um, is it clean ar around the area of the high trend dipstick, which I was just trying to illustrate in the last slide, where you've got a lot of dirt and debris, probably the person's not checking it very frequently. Is the fuel tank kept full or low? Uh, people who do not fill fuel tanks at the end of each day risk getting water or moisture in the fuel system, and uh, that's something to think about. So uh, you know, here we are looking at the motor. Um, you can look at these slides more closely later on. You know, if I look at this filter here, this is a hydraulic transmission system filter. Actually, on this tractor, I'll move that arrow. It's hard to see this in this small photograph, but that filter had been damaged by the lift on the cultivators coming up and hitting it. I'd be really worried about that. Um, here is a tractor that has a new oil filter on it, a new uh, this is one of the transmission system filters, as well as a new fuel filter. Here on this one down here in the lower left, we see, again, signs of leaks. Looking at the filters, see what things look like. Um, dipstick on this is hard to see in this picture. Going to the back of the tractor, looking at the port for where hydraulic transmission fluid goes in. Um, it does not show the dipstick in this picture for that. I should have shown that. I'm sorry I didn't. But I would look to see that this area is kept clean. You do not want dirt and debris getting into the hydraulic transmission system. Continuing with our inspection, uh, inspect the radiator. Does the cap seal tightly? Inspect the air filter. Um, you may have a different type of air filter on an older tractor. How tight is the fan belt? Is it in good condition? Same with the hoses. How does the exhaust pipe look? Is it bent, damaged? Look at the battery. Uh, are the terminals and posts clean, or are they highly corroded? Check the condition of the tires. Uh, look at the fuel filter or the glass sediment bowl on an older tractor. And then check the condition and age of the oil filter. So if we go and look at some of this stuff, in the top slide, we want to look at the, open the radiator cap and look at the coolant. That's what it should look like. It should look clean and clear. Usually it's a, kind of a Kool-Aid, lime Kool-Aid color. Going over here, if we look closely, you'll see there's a lot of debris on the screen in front of the radiator. This hasn't been cleaned in a while, which could possibly mean the engine's been running hot. Look at these battery terminals and posts. How corroded are they? Here we are inspecting an air filter on a tractor, or reinstalling a new one, actually. But that's how you would remove a paper element. Just pull off the top, pull it off, and then you can remove the filter. And then on older tractors, you're looking at what was called an oil bath air filter. And this cup at the bottom can actually be removed. It's going to, ideally, when you remove it, you'll find some oil at the bottom. And that's going to trap dirt and debris. And looking, one, to see if, in fact, there is oil there, that's a good sign that somebody's been at least checking it once in a while. And how clean is that oil? How are we doing, Kristen? Uh, you're doing great. We're at 11. We've got eight minutes. 
uh, and we're on slide 40. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're almost there, folks. Another thing to look for uh, on old tractor rims, uh, they used to use salt for the uh, antifreeze in the, in the ballast, the liquid ballast. And on this tractor tire rim here, we see where the valve is. And that valve stem has been leaking the ballast fluid, which was probably a salt, probably calcium chloride. And as we know, salts cause rust on metal. And you can see how rusty this uh, rim is from that leak. And I should have put a full slide of this tractor. This would definitely not be a tractor I'd want to buy, even if it was a good value. It needs a lot of work. More stuff to review. I think it's really important. Ask if there's an operator's manual available. On some used tractors, the owners will actually have a shop manual and the parts manual. Those are invaluable. Um, if, I'd like to see if there are service records and receipts. Um, are all the safety shields in place over the power takeoff and, and elsewhere? Are the decals legible? Um, there's something called an hour meter. Ford used to call these the proof meter to check how many hours are on the tractor. We measure tractor use in hours, not in miles. Um, any tractor, really, if you're an inexperienced operator or even if you are, I can't recommend anyone buying a tractor without a ROPS and a seatbelt. Um, some are going to argue with me that that's an added uh, a tractor with those features is going to be more expensive. I would counter and say, what's the worth of your life to you and your loved ones um, if you have a rollover? And then take a test drive. You're, you're the buyer. You're the, the person wanting to buy this tractor. If it's four-wheel drive, engage it. Check all the levers and switches. Make sure everything works as it's supposed to. One thing to be aware of, uh, some people will do a poof paint job where everything gets painted. You'll see that the alternator has been painted or the generator. Usually those are not the same color as the rest of the engine block. The belts will be painted, the hoses. That means somebody just maybe power washed the thing and just went over everything with paint. And that is not a restoration. A restoration is much more precise and accurate. Uh, beware of buying a tractor out of nostalgia or sentiment or because it is iconic, they may not be good work tractors but are appropriate for your situation, unless that's what you want to do is restore it. Um, of course, buying an older tractor like that, if you're willing, could teach you a lot about maintenance. And the tractor you buy should be used, not abused. And that's something to really look at. How was this tractor used, or was it indeed abused? And there's a lot of that out there, because a lot of people, frankly, don't know what they're doing with tractors. It's a real serious issue. And remember, this is our last point in the, in the, in the talk today. Um, a tractor is always going to be worth more to the person selling it. And you're the one buying. You're the one with the cash. You should be willing to, to negotiate and be prepared to negotiate, especially if you have cash in hand. That's a real big bargaining tool. Not that you should undervalue what it means to them, but there's always wiggle room in the purchase. So, and let's see. Uh, and there's my contact information. If anybody uh, wants to reach me directly, I should point out I am not affiliated with a university or the extension service or a nonprofit. I do this independently. And um, you know, I would ask that you, if you use any of this information, that you attribute it appropriately. I would appreciate that. So, uh, and I am available for consults on this material. So just to make a little pitch there. Thank, thanks so much, Shane. Um, and before we move into um, a broader question and answer session, um, I'm aware some people may need to sign off just in a, in a few minutes. Um, but I did just post the uh, link to the evaluation for today's session, so people could go there. Um, before you sign off, if you could copy and paste that. Uh, you are getting a bunch of thank yous now, Shane. Um, and I will also keep the recording going. So in case you need to sign off, uh, excuse me, the questions and answers that follow now will, will be on the recording uh, that will be posted on the session. So um, this is my official thank you to Shane for those who are signing off. Uh, and now we'll just continue on uh, with question and answers uh, until folks uh, need to leave or uh, Shane needs to leave. Thanks very much. Yes, yeah, so I'm willing to call stay on. To the quest great. I, yeah, I, that's I'm great. looking at the questions right now. Um, uh, okay, I'm, if I can just comment on some of the ones that have already come up, and I'm going from the bottom up. 
Uh, somebody made the point, um, M. Manning, is that, did you say Margaret or Marsha? Martha. Martha made Martha. the point that, um, you know, ask questions, of course, you, you talk to the people you're buying from. I should have said a few moments ago, I always prefer to buy used equipment from the original owner. And that person is likely to have records and receipts and know the history of the tractor from day one. And you make a good point, Martha. Not all of it is junk. I didn't mean to imply that at all. I hope that didn't come through. Um, you just need to really know what you're looking at. And if you aren't sure yourself or the people you're advising in your roles as trainers, to encourage people to get somebody to go and look at a tractor with them. A good point from Harry about checking grease fittings. Uh, absolutely. Another sign if things have been maintained well. Somebody's mentioning finding a John Deere for 16300 Excellent. If you can find a four-year-old, five-year-old tractor for that price with four-wheel drive and loader and 95 hours, that's amazing. I'd want to know what kind of hours those were. What does it look like? Is it clean? Donald, that's a really good point. If you can find that, that's an excellent buy. That's a really good deal there. Just commenting on these. Yes, uh, Howard mentions the poof factor of a fresh coat of paint, as I mentioned. Um, let's see, this next one from Martha. She purchased a used tractor through a dealer auction, had less than 50 hours on it. Um, again, you know, there's a time issue here. If you have the time and you can be patient, Martha, you make a great point. Uh, there are deals out there, but again, you need to know what you're looking at and what it is you really want. Just buying something because it's a good deal, it may not be appropriate to your needs. I really want to stress that. Um, is there an hour limit on a used tractor from Donald? You know, that's a good question. Um, I usually take the number of hours divided by the age of the tractor. And then what kind of use? What were they primarily using it for? Um, that's really hard to answer in that, you know, diesel engines can run for years and years and years. Uh, they're much more durable than gasoline engines, so that would be a variable. Um, what was the kind of use? I just did service on a Kubota L245H, the high clearance cultivating tractor for Kubota. It had 2,600 hours on it. That was made between 75 and 83 or 4. That tractor still got a lot of hours on it. That tractor should go to 5,000 hours easily if it's continued to be cared for well. Um, interestingly, on those offset cultivating tractors that vegetable growers like, all of the models made in Japan from the mid 70s to the mid 80s, they usually sell today for much more than what they sold for new because the demand is high and the availability is low. Howard asks, how much money per acre for a tractor is a good rule of thumb? Um, yeah, we have to qualify that, Howard, and say, you know, what's being grown on the, on the acreage and what kind of return do you need per acre for what the tractor is going to do? Good point. Uh, Donald, there are many tractors out there that do not have wheel width adjustment for vegetable work. Should this be a major consideration? I would say yes, if you're going to be doing vegetables and row spacing is important. Your bed spacing, um, you want to look at tractors that have wheels that can be uh, spread wider. So um, even my new Kubota, there is some, actually the front is very limited. The rear wheels, there are greater possibilities. So that, that's a good point, Donald. That's a really good point if you're a vegetable grower. Peter mentions you can get Cat 2 to Cat 1 adapters. That is true. So if you have a Category 2 three-point hitch, there are little uh, bushings that can be put into the, the attachment points to allow Category 1 implements to attach. The real issue there uh, that people want to look at is the power takeoff. If you're going from a Category 2 uh, three-point hitch tractor, to a category one three-point hitch implement using a power takeoff, the torque coming from the larger engine to the smaller implement could completely destroy the gearbox. So Peter's point is fine if you're talking about an implement like a disc harrow, perhaps, or a cultipacker cedar. I'd even be concerned about using a smaller uh, grading tool, if you were going to use a box scraper for landscaping and it's a category one box scraper going on a category two tractor, um, you might have a lot more power on that tractor to pull through things that the frame of the box scraper won't be able to tolerate. You'll actually damage the implement. So uh, yes and no to that point. 
Maggie says, do older tractors lose their horsepower? We talked about that. The answer is generally yes. Depends on how well it was maintained over that time. Um, and then we have, have a I new question that these? came in. Yep, I think you went scrolled back. And then we have a new one on the bottom from Brett. And asking, do you know anyone in New York who would come to your farm to go over what you currently have to help you determine preventative maintenance and what to look for? Um, I, I can't say that I do, Brett. Um, I actually am from New York State, and that's where I started farming, uh, outside of Syracuse. Um, and I've taught my, my two-day workshop for NOPA New York. Um, contact me directly. I can either try and put you in touch with somebody, or if I'm up in New York, I could come and, and do this. I mean, I do help people with that routinely, helping them assess both what they need to do for maintenance and um, what they have on their farm and what they need to, to look to do. So if I can make a plug for myself there, especially because you're in New York, and I do get up there uh, you know, regularly because I still have family there. Um, thank you, Martha, for your, your comment. Are there other questions, or, or does anybody want to join in now for specifics? On the, on the bottom, we have one more from Donald, if you scroll down, uh, Shane. And he's saying many, many vegetable growers have many different operations. Should they have more than one tractor available to reduce time for changing implements? OK, Donald, that's a very good question. And last year, I helped a beginning vegetable farmer get started and, uh, in Maine. And really sharp people. I really have a lot of respect for this young couple. They had come up with a, a full equipment list and a budget, uh, done their homework. And um, we talked quite a bit, because I thought there were some, um, some points in their thinking that could be broadened, and, and they could make decisions that would serve them better. So they were at a point where they were only ready to buy one tractor. And they were going to get a two-wheel drive tractor without a front-end loader. And I said, you know, if you're only going to have one tractor, I would recommend four-wheel drive, and I would recommend a front-end loader and get one that where you can take the loader off. You don't want that loader on all the time, especially when doing tillage. That's a lot of extra weight compaction issues with the soil. And the, the thing is, Donald, um, and I, I was a vegetable grower for the better part of 15 years uh, professionally. And we did have a cultivating tractor. And I had, I had an Alice Chalmers G, Farmall Cub. We had a Case 265 offset. We had a larger uh, utility tractor. So I've been there, but if you have to start out and, and you're wondering how to spend your money, one tractor can do most everything you need. Again, going back to the very early slides, versatility is key. So the tractor in the picture of the, the last slide where my bio info is or my contact info, again, that loader comes on and off. I've got four-wheel drive. I can till with that tractor. I could put a one-row cultivator on the back. I can even put a Lelai cultivating system on the back. Now, that assumes you're good at driving straight and, and you trust yourself to do blind cultivation, as they call it, where you're not able to look below the belly of a cultivating tractor to see what you're doing. But starting out, I think you can do it with just one tractor. And these folks were really pleased. I talked to these folks last week to ask them how that advice paid off for them. And they said they couldn't be happier, that they realized that their original thinking left out a lot of considerations that they hadn't thought of. And they said this winter, they used the four-wheel drive constantly moving snow. They were so glad to have the front end loader, especially one with a quick coupler where they could take the bucket off and use pallet forks. They said they don't even know how other farmers work without pallet forks. And on that note, I have a friend. When I bought my pallet forks, which was an afterthought on my own tractor, a local friend of mine said, he said to me, did you get pallet forks? And I said, no, why? He says, well, mine are the five sons I never had. And I thought, well, that's a good point. I don't have any kids, <laughs> and I'm getting older. And um, it turns out I use my pallet forks all the time for moving uh, materials. And I get hired to move things all the time for people. Because when you live on a corner in a rural area and you have a tractor with pallet forks and people see that, that's good, good marketing for me, who's a self-employed contractor. So uh, I think, Donald, yes, you know, initially, one tractor can do a lot of stuff. And then go get your cultivating tractor when you know you're in it for the long haul and you can afford that investment. As far as time to change implements, you know, the first farm I worked on, a dairy farm in upstate New York, had 10 tractors. And some of those tractors were dedicated to just one implement. That's great if you can afford it. But, you know, once you know what you're doing, changing implements, 
it's not that much time. I can get implements on and off in 10 minutes. And that's skill. And that goes back earlier in one of my slides about operator skill. And um, not to dismiss that lack of experience or training, but that really becomes a training issue. And you know, I could go on for hours on that because I do a lot with training. But um, that's a skill issue. And I think that's something where we need to raise the bar. We need to teach our trainees how to do this work. And we need to make sure we're doing it correctly ourselves. I see a number of people out there who do not know how to properly attach three-point hitch implements. And they waste a lot of time doing it when they are true labor savers, like the telescoping links. Hydraulic top links are great as well. They save a lot of time and energy. Was there another question that came up? Yes, Terry is asking, uh, how about two-wheel tractors like BCS and I believe it's pronounced gravel, Gravely? Gravely, yes, Terry. Uh, well, I own a BCS. Um, I love BCS tractors. I've operated over my career at least five or six of them. Um, that's a whole other conversation. I think it's all, a, well, it's not just scale, because uh, certainly a lot of vegetable farms that um, have larger tractors still want a BCS with a rototiller to do small jobs. Now, you mentioned Gravely as well. Um, I'm, I'm just flat up partial to BCS. I have a neighbor who's a big Gravely guy. And uh, I just think they're bulkier. They're not quite as user friendly as the BCS. And even having said that, the BCS requires a lot of, um, th there's some challenges in that. So uh, just to know that the BCS literature makes it look like they're super easy to use. Um, you know, it requires you have a, a large span between your your fingers and your thumb. And for people who have smaller hands, reaching those control levers on a BCS can be real challenging. So um, something to think about with that. But I really love BCS tractors. And the maintenance, you know, you've got a spark plug. You've got engine oil changes. You've got a transmission oil. You do have to think about that. And air filter, um, keeping the fins clean, there's really not much to it. But I will say this, Terry, if you're looking at buying a used one, there's a lot of uh, BCS machines out there that have been really abused. Again, I think we, you know, part of this whole conversation, and I realize this is a train the trainers, uh, there are a lot of people out there that don't know how to operate this stuff. And so in my going around the region and looking, I've seen a lot of misuse or abuse. And I, I think if you're looking at used machinery, if you know what you're looking at, you'll be able to tell those signs and, and um, make better decisions. Thanks, Again, uh, uh, Shane. Yep. Go, uh, let's see. Horsepower size recommendation for a pasture-based farm aimed at the use of moving round bales, clipping small-scale haying. Uh, OK, Jen. Well, I'm, I'm biased because I'm a vegetable grower first. Uh, I have worked on uh, farms. Let's see, I do a, an annual job at a pasture-based uh, farm with uh, cows, goats, sheep, and they do clipping. They do small-scale haying. Um, they move round bales. Sorry about that noise in the background. Um, I would say to that, um, this person bought about a 45 horsepower New Holland a couple of years ago. And that tractor seems to be able to do what they need it to do in terms of mowing. They've got enough power to move the round bales around. Um, you could definitely do small-scale haymaking with that. So I would say, you know, starting, you know, probably 30, at, at the low end, 35, you're probably going to need closer to 40 to 50 for that. For that. But somebody with, with more knowledge on that might be able to, to answer more accurately. But I'd say you'd probably want 40 horsepower minimum to do the work you're describing there. It also depends on how much acreage you're talking about for, for making hay. Um, Small scale, do you mean equipment or do you mean acreage? Um, you know, because you want to be able to cover ground quickly. So a larger tractor will do that faster, obviously. I hope I answered that, que that question well enough. But I, I'd say you probably are looking at starting around 40 and moving up to 50. Somewhere in that range, you should be able to do all of that fairly well. Um, you might be able to get away with less, but I'm worried about the load of the bales on a smaller tractor in terms of the lifting capacity of the hydraulic pump. I appreciate your comments, the, the thanks that are coming through.
Terry agrees on the pallet forks. Uh, yeah, Terry, good point. They do need to support the weight. Um, and, and people get into trouble with their front end loaders in that they try and lift more than the, the they're capable of lifting. So uh, that's going to be a function of horsepower. Uh, how I think are that we, was our last question. Can we continue? Yeah, I think that was our last you question. Want to take a poll I, and see if people? <laughs> I I think that was our last question, and I don't see that anybody else is typing right now because we can see if folks are working in the chat room. So I think we can um, uh, wrap it up. And just a reminder to folks too that uh, Shane did ask if folks would share their emails. If it's okay to um, share your your email with him so he can let you know a future training. So I did put out that question in the last email. If you haven't responded yet, if you could let me know, that would be great. And then I'll just send your email to Shane. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I know we're looking at two trainings. I do a two-day uh, tractor operation safety and maintenance workshop. And we have one that's scheduled for Northern Maryland, uh, just south of the PA line on uh, the second weekend in October. And it looks like we're going to do another one in central New Jersey, probably also in October, probably towards the end of the month. And in between now and then, I'm sure some others will be cropping up as well. Um, New Hampshire might be, well, actually, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, somewhere in there in the fall, I think there's one that we're trying to work out right now. So I will be back up in the Northeast doing one sometime this year. Thanks, Shane. If you, and if you have any flyers for that or announcements and you send them to me, I can make sure to distribute it to everybody. Okay. And we can sure. also put it up on the Groundwork site. Great. Great. Well, thank you, well, everybody. Thank you, thank you Shane. Very good. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.